Cameron, you okay. start? Yeah, you start. Yeah, I'll start. Hello, welcome to the Surplus Boys channel. Hello. I'm Patrick. I'm Nick. We are going to be showcasing just the 1911 today. There will be more videos to come on the uh, competitor to this in our series of comparisons, I guess. You yeah, can, yeah. You can make we'll, it a series. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we're going to start with an unboxing. Oh, how little you knew. Gerber flat iron for anybody who cares. Me cleaver. Then I will actually, there you go, checkpoint Charlie's. Okay. And what I bought is 10 stripper clips. 10 Mauser stripper clips. Look at that. Nice and crusty. Yeah, crusty. Some of these are actually nice. Back and forth. Now you've seen the gun to put it in. We are here to talk about the 1911, specifically the 1911 today. It is. Yes, it is there. Yep. Flap holster that is normal for it. This, unfortunately, this is clear, just so everybody knows. It's clear. Uh, this is a Rock Island 1911. This is not original 1911. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the money for that. Yeah, we are too poor. Yeah. Um, so, for the sake of this video, I will be using this and giving you a bunch of information on the 1911. And this will just happen to be here. And then, I'll, and then I'll give you some information <laughs> on Rock Island itself. So, as most people know, 1911, designed by uh, John Moses Browning. Adopted by the U.S. military in 1911. Um, I have some production numbers for you. Not all of them. I only did the best research I can in the limited amount of time that I had. Um, I'm also lazy. Okay. Well, <laughs> Patrick. So I have the cult production numbers from World War II. They made uh, 628,000 1911s in World War II. Ithaca made 335,000 1911s. Um, Ithaca, Colt, and Remington Rand... Um, are the three main manufacturers of 1911s from World War II. The most common ones you run into are probably Ithaca and Remington Rand. Colts kind of tend to have a higher price because it's Colt. <laughs> Going into World War I, obviously Colt made 1911s in World War I. Uh, Springfield made 1911s in World War I. They're kind of rare. The parts interchangeability sucked on them. Uh, so the US government wasn't completely fond of the Springfield 1911. Um, I don't have the production numbers of Colt's 1911s during World War One. I. I that skipped my mind for some reason. Um, North American Arms, which was a Canadian company, was contracted to make 1911s. I could not find any production numbers on that on that at all. So I don't I don't know how many they made. I don't know if they made just a batch of 500. I don't know if they made a thousand or uh, uh, ten thousand. If they made ten thousand, they'd be you know easy to find, I guess. But they I don't have any production numbers on it. And then Remington UMC made 1911s in World War One. They were the poorest quality 1911 made in World War One. The finish was poor, and all around they just were not good quality. <laughs> just like us. Well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, compare that to Remington Rand, which made 1911s in World War Two. The Remington Rand was the highest produced, lowest priced, highest quality 1911. Or did I say lowest produced? I did. Yeah, I suppose so. They are the low. They were not the <laughs> lowest produced. I actually have the number right here. They made eight hundred and seventy five thousand nineteen elevens. They were the lowest priced, highest quality nineteen elevens that the U.S. government had. But it was Remington Rand in World War One. It was Remington UMC. Well, between World War One and between World War Two, Remington had some financial issues. Um, and well, by World War Two, they were making filing cabinets and typewriters and uh, yeah, yeah, whatever they could. Yeah, I mean. You can find a Remington typewriter still. That's usually allowed with interwar period. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, obviously Remington had their sporting uh, their sporting arms, but their sporting arms just weren't, I guess, selling as much. I don't know that much about that. So we're going to go to the harder manufacturers to find. The first one being Singer. Singer made 51911s as a test batch for the U.S. government. The U.S. government said, "Hey, these are too high quality. We're going to have you make precision aircraft uh, sites, and I believe they made bomb sites. So they are the hardest 1911 to find." And they're expensive. <laughs> like $250,000. And Patrick expensive. wants one. Uh, no, I don't. Well, I, My wife wants the one. The wife wants one, yeah. The one I want is the next one I'll talk to you about, which is the Union Switch and Signal. Now, I like trains. Oh, my God. I work for a railroad. <laughs> Union Switch and Signal, being a railroad company, is unique to make guns. It was actually one of the only railroad companies during the war that made guns. 
No other railroad companies did. Um, union switch and signal, this I'm gonna have to look at my notes for quite a bit because there's a lot to it. Um, union switch and signal uh, was contracted in 1942 for a batch of 200,000 1911s. They made in 19, by 1943, they delivered, um, there was 200,000 cut to 30,000. They delivered in 1943, they delivered 30,000 of them. Then they switched to carbine parts man manufacture and they made, they didn't make M1 carbines, they made parts. I think they made bolts, trigger groups, stuff like that because barrels and stuff were being made by High Standard um, and H&R, Harrington and Richards. Um, then the government asked for another uh, 25,000 pistols. So on all, there's 50,000 Union Switch and Signal 1911s floating around in the world. And they're like five grand in the used market. And that I can probably afford at some point in my life. Um, so so that's, that's the information, a broad, very abridged information on the 1911, its manufacturer. There was uh, copies made of it. Obviously, there's always copies made of a handgun um, by other countries. Uh, Norway, I believe, contracted with Colt to make a copy of it. Um, Argentina, I believe, made the Ballister Molina, which was a different, which was a 1911, basically, without a group safety. Um, and I'm sure there's other countries that I'm forgetting that probably um, made their own copies of it or whatever. I mean, the gun we're comparing there's this to. Probably Kyber Pass models. Probably. Yeah. And there's Pretty probably much any gun that's copied is by Kyber Pass. Pass. That's the one in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. Where there's probably. Oh, no. Or is that Af India? No, it's Pakistan, I think. Pakistan. Pakistan yeah. or Afghanistan, one of those. Exactly. Things. Like, the gun we're comparing, we're going to be comparing this to in a separate video is the Tokarev. They copied the 1911. And in some ways, they made it better. And in some ways, it's just atypically Russian. Um. So this being in the Iraq Island, though, this obviously is a facsimile of the 1911A1. There is some issues with it that I will go over in a second. Rock Island, um, owned by Arms Corps, has actually been around for 100 years in the Philippines. I did not know that until I f did some information on it. I did some digging. Um, so this gun is made in the Philippines, not made in the U.S., unfortunately. What are you going to do? It's a $500 1911. Yeah, probably one of the most affordable ones that is in the... You know, kind of the old school 1911 A1 style. Yeah. Obviously, if you want a, a one that is, of course, more of a more modern style that has obviously accoutrements for lights and sights and, and like yeah, that. better sights, better. You can still get you those know, from Rock you know, Island. Kimber and other. Well, Rock you can get Island them from Rock Island. And, yeah. uh, Gerson has been a company that's yeah, come up a couple years. Um, Gerson 1911s are actually quite nice. Um, but uh, or if you want an actual just reproduction of a World War One 1911, you can get a Cimarron for the yeah, same price. Cimarron. Basically, that, that is. Um, and then uh, <laughs> Tsas, Tsa, it's a I Turkish company. Okay. They make a 1911 that's also very affordable. But, and I know pe some people don't like Rock Island. Some people love Rock Island. I knew going and buying this gun, there could be problems with it. And <laughs> the only problem I have, like this thing comes to the range with me. Every time I go to the range, I shoot it, no problem. I clean it, it works. The only problem I have with it is the stock mags at 19, that uh, Rock Island ship with it. They're cheap reproductions or copies of Mechgar mags or whatever. I don't even know. They suck. They have the <laughs> anti-tilt followers. They're nice. You can take them apart. You can clean them. But I've had them, I've had multiple times where the slide won't lock back on the last round. And that's the only malfunction I've had. To some people that's like, whatever. It's just, you know, but yeah. it's also when you get this gun, you get it with an eight round magazine. That bothers me a little bit because we're surplus boys. We're, yeah. we're going for as much authenticity exactly. as we possibly can. So that bothers me a little bit. Price limit. <laughs> with buying this and getting an eight round mag, and it's like, I don't want that. I want a regular GI seven round mag. But that, that all that aside, that's just me. Um, obviously, when you get this gun, it'll come with uh, wood grips on it. I probably should have grabbed the wood grips because I. Yeah, well, because. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> these are actual original World War II 1911 grips. So this being. Like I said, a facsimile of the 1911. It is not. It is a combination of the 1911 and the 1911 A1. So, like, it's got an A1 grip safety with the extended beaver tail. It's got an A1 trigger with the scallops and everything on it. But it's got a 1911 style straight uh, back strap, which I didn't, or mainspring housing, which I didn't put on there. That's how it came. And honestly, I like it. I don't like the A1 style back strap. I don't like the palm swell it has. Yeah, yeah. I like this. I think it fits better in the hand. Um, but aside from that, like I said, this gun's been nothing but reliable. Um, going to the subjects of magazines, though, um, we live in the modern age. So obviously, you can get 10 round magazines for these. You can get 15 round magazines for them. I don't yeah. think they work that well. I think they're not. Anyway, we can't get them anyway. Here. Exactly. We live so. in New Jersey. So, um, 
I have a 10 round Chip McCormick Power Mag. It works great. Um, when I bought the gun, this isn't one of them, but I bought standard GI Springfield magazines. This is actually a Colt mag. This is what I like, except that you can't take them apart and clean them. But this is what I use most of the time. I like these. Th these are Wilson Combat mags. I like these a lot. I just wish they weren't 50 bucks a piece. Um, but they... <laughs> the price of quality. <laughs> yeah, I know. They are really, really, really good magazines for what they are. So, but that's a little bit on that. But the only other thing I'll touch upon is like uh, mag pouches. So this is an actual, this is an original World War I 1911 mag pouch. And when we pull this in for a close-up, I'll show this to you too. Um, but this is a two, two mag pouch. Um, the World War II ones are cut lower. This, I believe the date says 1918. I could be wrong. I can't really read it. Um, but this also has an actual, that's a GI mag from, I believe the eighties. I could be wrong, but that's an actual USGI 1911 mag. It kind of sucks. Um, and then, um, this is what the 1911 mags used to ship like back in the back in the day. They used to actually ship with a lanyard loop on the bottom of them. And you'll see this gun is devoid of a lanyard loop. I want to get a mainspring housing that has one. So yeah, um, that's basically the abridged version of that and a little bit of history on Rock Island. Um, okay, so I guess we'll bring it in for a uh, closer yeah, look. Yeah, we'll huh? bring it in for a close up look. So here's disassembly from the 1911. We'll go over a little bit of the controls first. First, we'll make sure this is clear. Those are dummy rounds, shut up. All right, so controls in the 1911, pretty straightforward. At this point, probably everybody knows them. You have your thumb safety, grip safety. This does have a half cock. This is, remember, this is a reproduction, Rock Island 1911. It does have a half cock. And then you got your slide release right here. That's all you need to know. So, disassembly of this, like I said, we've already checked to make sure this gun's clear. Disassembly of this is easy. Put your safety on, push down the barrel bushing. Usually I like to put it against the table, push down, not the barrel bushing, the uh, plug on the end of the recoil spring. There's a name for that. I don't remember what it is. Take that out. Now, take your safety off and slide this back to the disassembly notch, which is right about there. Push the slide release out, pull it out, just like that. And now you can pull the slide off the frame. You don't need the frame anymore. Now you can pull your recoil spring out the front and your recoil spring guide. And then you can rotate the barrel bushing. Actually, no, that was the right way, 180 degrees. No, that wasn't the right way. The other way, and it'll come out. And then you can slide your barrel out. And that is the 1911 Dissemble. Now we'll talk about some of the locking lugs and stuff that you can't, <clears throat> that you couldn't see before. So in there you can see where the locking lugs are milled into the actual top there. And you can see we have a Tokara video that'll be out later. Um, these locking lugs are actually a little bit more substantial than that is. Um, but you can see that there. Here, if you want to take the slide apart farther, you can take out the firing pin, the extractor, and the firing pin spring out through here. You just depress this button. That's the end of the firing pin. I'm not gonna do that for this. On the frame, you see the hammer and trigger assembly. The trigger actually is a bar that goes around the inside of the magazine uh, well. But this you can take apart farther. I'm not gonna do that in this video. This you can take off the grips, the two screws that hold the grip on. Push this pin out, pull the back strap out, pull the safety out, the grip safety will come out, and then you can, there's a couple other pins that you can drive out to pull the hammer and everything else out. And then the magazine release is just a screw. So that's that. So that is the 1911 Dissemble. And uh, now you're going to watch me struggle, put it back together. All right. So we're reassembling the 1911. First, you're going to push the barrel into the front. Just like that. Make sure your falling link is, I don't know, it's going to screw with you anyway. Then you're going to put your recoil spring and recoil spring guide back in. Push that in, just like that. You're going to want to make sure that that falling link is so you can actually see the hole. Because you're going to line that up through the hole in the frame. So now you're going to take the frame, you're going to light up your slide rails, and you're going to push this through. And you're going to push it through very slowly until you can see 
the following link, which I believe is right about there. So now that you do that, you're going to put the slide release in on the other side. And I'll now flip the gun over now that I know that I have it captured. So you're going to do that. Now, when you put this in, there's a plunger here that is the plunger for the safety and for the magazine release, or for the uh, slide release. When you do that, pull this out a little bit or you're going to leave an idiot mark on the frame. You'll see it on 1911s. If you care about your 1911, don't do that. This gun is a Rock Island. It's cheap. It's parkerized. I don't think I could. So now you're going to pull the slide back to the disassembly notch. You're going to push that in and now your slide's on. Put the safety back on, put the gun down. Now you're going to take the barrel bushing, push it back in, and we'll push that in like that without letting it fling up and hit the camera or the dog or the neighbor's dog or whatever. For some reason, it seems to be that I can't put a 1911 back together. They ask you how you are. You Why is that be? Say that you're fine when you're Why not really this one fine. Again? You just can't get into it because they would never understand. I've done this 10,000 times. Oh, you know why? Because I put that in before the spring goes in. My apologies. So now you want to push that in, rotate that over till it clicks, and there you go. 1911 is back together. Function test it. Put the mag back in. And put safety on. So that is how you reassemble the 1911. Now we're going to go over a little bit of the markings on this. This is a Rock Island, so you obviously have the Rock Island marking right there, and you have the uh, Made in Philippines marking. Um, nothing special. These grips are uh, original World War II grips, so they have a rack number on them. But aside from that, this is a new production 1911. It's not winning any beauty contests, but that's about it. All right. So you just saw the disassembly and reassembly of this uh, fine piece of American engineering. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now we're going to talk about some conclusions, some other things, some things I don't want to talk about, but we'll get there. So um, in conclusion, it's the best handgun ever made. Plain and simple. That's it. Close the video. No. Um, <laughs> we're done. Yeah, we're done. Now, the 1911, I know, especially in the modern era of handguns, where everybody can buy a SIG or a Glock or, you know, give me another modern, an HK, whatever, you know. All the stuff we don't know about. This holds seven rounds. Okay, fine. I get it. It's only seven rounds of 45. Whatever. <laughs> I'm going to sound like a FUD. I don't care. All I need is seven rounds and I'm happy. You know what's really funny about this too, Patrick? What? Whose mic's off? Oh, is my mic off? It's I, rough. I want God's <laughs> caliber. I want 45 ACP. Um, I just sound like a FUD. But, um, and he looks like one. Yeah, I do. That's the worst part. Yeah. Look at me. But in general, I like the 1911. I'm happy with it. And I don't care what people say about it being, you know, not a usable, not a viable handgun anymore. Yeah, that's the one thing also as well. I guess we're going to follow a, uh, <clears throat> a route of our of the ladies and gents over at CN Arsenal and kind of ask the question of, obviously, Patrick could use this for self-defense. Because that, I mean, that's that's practically what Patrick would have used for self-defense. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing he's grabbing when, when uh, there's a bump in the night. Um, yep. Obviously, other people uh, might not, but... Um, I guess for both of us, that's a viable option. Obviously, it's better than nothing. Exactly. Um, that's the and it's better than blasting somebody with a hole through with 306. Yeah, it's obviously... That's that a, costs a lot of money. Yeah, that's a better option because, <laughs> first of all, it's not going to go through the whole house, hit the next house, and hit the neighbor's dog. And it is actually, since it's such a, it's a larger caliber... It'll, it's, it'll stay in the person. Yeah, it'll put stay this in into the, a, mor yeah, a morbid conversation. Yeah, there, there 45 is, ACP will not over-penetrate. Yeah. Into... You know, another wall no, or something. So It'll that's, usually stay. That's in a person. fat wall. If you say, "Oh, that's a two hundred thirty, yeah, two hundred two hundred thirty grain bullet moving at ballpark eight hundred thirty feet." Per yeah, second. I'm sure you can get them moving faster or slower. Yeah, obviously that's way slower than it's not going to knock you on the ground. Minutes. It's not going to knock you on the ground like everybody says it will, but it's going to fucking stop you. Yeah, obviously getting shot with anything. Yes, yeah. it's going to suck. Won't recommend. But I've never been shot by anything. Not as Patrick. 
We're gonna keep it that way. Hopefully. Yeah, we're gonna keep it that way. That's that's it. So <laughs> aside from that, the only other uh, thing I'm gonna put out there. This is a very random nuance, and it's probably only something I've noticed because I I am I am me. But we talked about the mag pouches and how this is a standard 1911 mag pouch. Now there's a World War II variant that I just don't have with me today. Whatever. If you watch movies from the 70s or a certain TV show by the name MASH, um, you will see them with M1 carbine pouches. Now, some of you, like I thought when I was a child, think that a 1911 magazine fits into a carbine pouch and closes. It does not. <laughs> <laughs> so, just keep that in mind. End of story. Yeah, just keep that in mind. That there concludes of a Rock Island 1911. Yep, so hopefully see you in the next and... video. We'll put out that basic YouTuber stuff. Like, yeah, comment, subscribe. Like, comment, subscribe for the let, algorithm guys. Yes, let those, let our overlords that, that control what we do on the internet, let them know that, that we we're can, trying. That we're trying. <laughs> and that's it. That's all. So bye. I'm ready until I'm over there. So. <laughs> I think I still don't have a really good smell. <laughs> That's a blooper.